I think the, the reason for prices running the way they did uh, to record highs never seen in the history of the coal industry was the onset of the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict or war in Europe. And then the onset of nation states and countries beginning to look at energy security. In fact, if you look at those numbers, you see the uh, the sudden increase in buying activity from Europe. And Europe became the theater that drove prices in 2022 and 2023. And with it, the big prices that we saw. Do I expect another Black Swan event like that anytime soon? I mean, I wish I had uh, such a crystal ball. But it wouldn't be a Black Swan if people can could predict it that accurately. Is it likely that there'll be other geopolitical events that would have an impact on prices? Absolutely. To the same impact, I doubt it. It's very difficult to, to, to predict prices other than to say to you that um, uh, the, the current uh, range that we see in our view is what prices should do based on fundamentals. We think that those fundamentals remain supportive uh, China, India continue to uh, to build new thermal coal build. If you look at last year, record demand for thermal coal, uh, and by most estimates this year, we'll probably see a marginal uh, growth, if not the same as last year, which says demand continues to be strong. That is against the backdrop of uh, less investment going into coal, there could be other factors that could affect uh, supply in the short term, such as the uh, the onset of the La Nina weather event uh, in the southern hemisphere uh, for summer, uh, and that could affect Australia, Colombia, South Africa, which are significant um, seaborne supply regions. And therefore, from that point of view, we expect prices to be supportive. Expect prices at current levels to be to find support. When we announced our results uh, in March early this year, uh, in terms of our capital allocation framework, we said we were setting aside the amount of cash required to complete the investment into the two approved projects. W what I've seen with capital projects uh, and what destroys enormous value is when you start projects and before you complete them, you stop them and you restart again. I mean, it's just... It, it destroys value like you've never said. What you want to be able to do is once you decide to invest in a project, because its economics are compelling through the cycle, you want to complete it. 2024 was always going to be PKF funding, but because we've already allocated that funding and reserved it on our balance sheet, there is no logic in, in stopping to complete the funding for, for those projects. If you look at our cash generation, Yes, we've invested a little bit more in building the robustness and resilience of our business and competitiveness for the future to ensure that this business uh, generate attractive returns. We think that's good investment. And if you are doing that in the context of a strong balance sheet, we think that's uh, a good capital allocation framework. The point we make in addition to that is that we actually very disciplined in terms of how we spend that money. The two projects are on time and on budget. And in fact, in the case of elders, we've even gone further and revised the total estimated cost down from 2 billion to 1.9. If you take all those factors together, I think that's testament that in fact, we are much more disciplined from a capital allocation point of view and execution of our projects. What gives us um, uh, some confidence or cautious optimism, if I had to put it that way, is the fact that Transnet has stopped the bleeding. It has not gone backwards. Yes, it's 47.3 uh, against 47.9 the previous year, more or less the same. And we make the point that, uh, you know, the first half was probably a mixed bag with really some good months. And then we had that, those derailments in May, no, in April, May. But overall, we, we're quite pleased with some of the work that the, the team is doing. The building blocks that we speak about uh, is additional new locals coming into the core corridor, uh, what we've been doing with critical spares, the continued collaboration on, 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 uh, on security, 
uh, the shutdown that they they had uh, and the work that that shutdown did both from uh, rail infrastructure and uh, signaling so all those actually give us some confidence that we should see a stabilization and beginning to improve the performance of transnet we have taken a pragmatic view that we probably shouldn't see too much improvement in 2024. But in 2025, if you're adding capacity, you continue to do uh, critical maintenance, all those should should improve performance. Where would that land? Our view may be somewhere between 55 and 60 million tons annualized in transit in 2025, which will give us more or less 12.5 12, 12 million tons uh, of rail capacity for 2025. And that would be quite a pleasing outcome for us if we can get that.